Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with internal forced convection uh, with reference to the textbook of Sengel and Kajar, chapter 8. Uh, we have started looking at it at general, but now we are really going to start going into the details uh, in this paragraph. And I think this paragraph is about one of the most important ones in chapter 8, so you really have to go and work through this very well. And I want to recommend that you actually, when you start taking notes now, divide your page into two parts, and then everything I'm going to do on the board, do it in this first column, and then when I get to the second part, you do this part next to it so that you can compare the two parts. It's then easier to see the differences. So the first part is the case of a constant heat flux. A constant heat flux. And the second part is a constant wall temperature. Now, when we have laminar flow, in almost all cases, it's going to be one of these two cases, either a constant heat flux or a constant wall temperature. Now, where do we get a constant heat flux and when do we get a constant wall temperature? Constant heat flux are typically in nuclear reactors and or radiation from the sun on a tube, that would give us an application of a constant heat flux, and then also electrical heating. Electrical heating. So those are the two cases that will ensure that you get a constant heat flux. The other case is where we've got a phase change, and that would be the case for all condensers, boilers and evaporators. So what do we mean with condensers, boilers and evaporators? When you're going to be in industry and you work in the HVAC industry, the heating, ventilation and air conditioning, you're always going to work with condensers and evaporators. It's the most two important components of a vapor compression cycle. For those of you who's going to work in the industry where we generate electricity, you're going to work with boilers and cooling towers. So it's exactly the same. Now what is important in the case where we've got phase change, if I can go back to your thermodynamics, on a TS chart, temperature entropy chart, if that is the saturation line, then for a boiler, we will change it from a liquid to a vapor. The very important thing, however, is to take note that most of the heat transfer is when the temperature remains constant during a phase change. So that is an excellent example where the wall temperature remains constant. Ts is a constant. The opposite is for a cooling tower after it expanded from the turbine. You need to change it from a gas to a liquid. So that's for a cooling tower or evaporator. It's going to be exactly the same. And again, the temperature is going to remain constant for most of this process. Yes, it might be that you start there with a superheat of 5 degrees Celsius or 3 degrees, and you end up here with saturated liquid. However, most of the heat transfer, about 80% of 90% of the heat that is being transferred is at a constant surface temperature. So those are the two important applications, the one of the constant wall temperature 
the other one of a constant heat flux. Constant heat flux will be a tube like that, and we've got an electrical wire around it. Or if we look at the electrical tube from the top, there will be radiation, can be from a nuclear, can be nuclear radiation, or from the sun, and the tube or the geometry is being heated at a constant heat flux. Normally, we do not really get applications of the cooling at a constant heat flux. It can be done experimentally and in industry, but normally we do not do that. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, except now for the sketch I'm going to make now, I would like to recommend that you keep on working on this side of your paper, on the <coughs> left-hand side, and then only when I get to the constant wall temperature, then you move to the second column. But the thing in general that is important is if we've got a tube, which is a typical example of where we get internal forced convection, and in this case we use a circular tube because that's the easiest one to work with, but it can be a rectangular tube or any other geometry, then in general this problem reduces to an inlet temperature and an outlet temperature. TI and TE. <clears throat> and for all these cases, we've got a surface temperature, which we're going to call TS, and that is going to be TM, the mean temperature of the fluid. <clears throat> so in general, we can always say that the heat transfer rate is equal to the mass flow rate CP multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. We've got a sound problem. I think I disappeared for a moment. Okay. So in general, that is the case. But then, if there's phase change, then you should know it is equal to the mass flow rate minus the enthalpy difference. So that is in general. So that is the heat transfer if we look at it from the inlet to the outlet, but we can also calculate the heat transfer rate from the heat transfer coefficient, which is the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area, and we would like to write it as the surface temperature minus the mean temperature of the fluid. And these two are, of course, should get, give the same heat transfer rate. The previous lecture, I've spent a lot of time showing you in terms of, not with the previous lecture, but also with the lectures before that, looking at the development of the boundary layer, and we know that the heat transfer coefficient is not constant. In the beginning, the flow is still developing until the two boundary layers meet each other, where the flow is fully developed, and only then will the heat transfer coefficient be a constant. So the heat transfer coefficient that we actually want to use there is the average heat transfer coefficient. So in general, if that is the tube, and we look at the heat transfer coefficient, then we get something like that. And there the flow is fully developed. So the heat transfer coefficient is a function of x. It's not constant everywhere. So if we take this graph and we integrate it, and that is the average, then that is the average heat transfer coefficient that we would like to use, if you have it. In most cases, however, that will not be known. In general, just remember also that the heat transfer rate can be written as the heat flux multiplied by the surface area, where Q is then the units is equal to in watts per square meter. So in many cases, we prefer only to work with the heat flux. And then, if you look at this, then you can see that the heat flux is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface temperature minus the mean temperature in general. So we don't have to work with the area if we've got the heat flux. Right, now I'm going to make quite an important graph. I'm going to do it like this, and here I'm also going to 
my graph of x. And here I'm going to put in the tube which is being heated. So there are three, two graphs and one figure underneath it. And with this figure, I would like to show like that that it is a constant heat flux. Now because I don't have enough room there, I'm just going to show it here. So if that is the tube, and that is where x is equal to 0, and that is where x is equal to L, then the heating is constant from all around. And in many cases, we are just going to show it like that to indicate it's a constant heat flux. In the cases when we get to the constant wall temperature, we are going to indicate it as Ts. Ts is a constant, and the heat flux is a constant. So that is equal to L there. And I'm also going to use blue for the fluid that is being heated, and the red for the higher temperature, which is the wall temperature. Now, the thing with a constant heat flux is, let's look, let's look at an example of where that is the inlet temperature, which is equal to 20. And let's suppose it is water. And we are interested in the fluid temperature. temperature of the fluid. Let's see if we can determine what the temperature of the fluid should be for a constant heat flux. In general, we can say that the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat flux Qs multiplied by the surface area, and that is equal to the mass flow rate Cp multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. If that is the tube, and that is equal to x equals zero, we are also interested to know what the temperature would be at x. So that would be at any point inside the tube. And let's see if we can determine that. From this equation, we can determine that the outlet temperature is equal to Qs multiplied by the surface temperature divided by the mass flow rate Cp plus Ti. We can also write this as the heat flux multiplied by P, which is the perimeter, multiplied by L. That would be the surface of a, circ of a tube, P multiplied by L, divided by the mass flow rate Cp plus Ti. P, if it's a circular tube, we can write it as the heat flux multiplied by pi, multiplied by the diameter, multiplied by L divided by M dot Cp plus Ti. Okay, now we have to remember this is for a circular tube only, where the perimeter P is equal to pi multiplied by the diameter. So in general we can see that the outlet temperature is equal to mx plus c. OK, where in this case, x is now equal to l, ml plus c. So this is a constant. That's a constant. The mass flow rate is a constant. And in general, the Cp doesn't change that much. So we can use this equation to determine the outlet temperature. So that is Te. So in general, that's very easy. We can determine the outlet temperature 
already from this equation. We don't have to go and write it this fancy, but you will see the advantages of writing it like this just now. So that is the outlet temperature. If we are interested in a general point X, so any point in between or here at 75% of the total length, we can rather say that the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat flux multiplied by the surface area is equal to the mass flow rate Cp multiplied by Tx minus Ti. So Tx is any general point X from the inlet. It can be 500 millimeters, 7 meters, or 10 meters, or whatever. This is mass, mass flow rate Cp, or M dot. So again, we can write Tx in general as Q, the heat flux multiplied by the area, mass flow rate Cp, plus Ti. And now the surface area, remember, if we are interested in the temperature there, it is being influenced by the heat flux from this direction. So we can write the area as P multiplied by X, divided by M dot CP plus Ti. Thus, in general, we can write it as MX plus C. Where M is this gradient, and Ti is the constant. You see that? So it is the equation of a linear line. Therefore, it means that this temperature distribution from the inlet to the outlet must be a straight line. That is a huge advantage. If we know that, so we know that the inlet temperature is doing that. Uh, not the inlet temperature, that's the inlet temperature, but the temperature inside the fluid increases linearly. If you think about it, the heat flux is a constant, so for every one millimeter that you move inside the fluid, you'll get the same temperature, the same heat flux from the outside, so it forces the temperature increase to be linear. Now again, for a circular tube, If it's circular, then P is equal to pi d i. You can put it in there, and then you can write the temperature as function of x is equal to the heat flux multiplied by pi d i m dot c p multiplied by x plus d i. This is for circular only. Because that area is that surface area. Now this, this is not given in your textbook, so I think you need to make the necessary notes to indicate that because it's a very important one. So in general, I would recommend that you rather just write it as Tx is equal to the heat flux multiplied by the perimeter divided by m dot cp x plus di. Okay, not in your textbook, but it's very obvious if you've looked through the other equation to see that this is valid. So this is a linear line and it tells us the fluid temperature as it goes through the tube. <coughs> Okay, now, <clears throat> that would now be for the fluid temperature, but I'm not moving towards the second column yet. So I'm not going on here, I'm still busy with this part. But the first part was the temperature of the fluid, and now we're going to look at the temperature of the surface. So I'm still in the left column. So the surface temperature, 
Okay, for the surface temperature, let's write again the equation of the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area, multiplied by Ts minus Tn. Q, Q dot can be written as the heat flux multiplied by the surface area is the heat transfer multiplied by the surface area. I'm, I'm going to keep on doing this for the first few lectures until you're used to it to see that we can write the heat flux as equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface temperature minus the mean temperature. Okay, so if we are now interested at the outlet, just like with a fluid, we've started with the inlet and then we've looked at if we can determine the outlet temperature. For the last chapter we're going to use to do in this, in this module, the heat exchangers is going to be very important. So normally for any heat exchanger you would like to know the inlet and outlet temperature for both the streams. So here we would like to determine that outlet temperature. We also do not have the inlet temperature yet. And especially because you have to remember we've got the heat transfer coefficient as I've indicated that is doing that. That, that is only fully developed. So the heat transfer coefficient is only constant once the flow is fully developed. If it's developing then the heat transfer coefficient is a function of x. So looking at this equation, you can immediately see the complication in terms of determining the surface temperature. So what I'm going to do is, to make all this clear, is I'm going to put an example into this problem so that we can typically see what happens with the fluid temperatures and what happens with the surface temperature. And this example is now going to be a tube with an inlet temperature of 20, the mass flow rate is 0.7 kilograms per second, the CP is equal to 1080 joules per kilogram Kelvin. The length of the tube is 5 meters and the tube diameter is 10 millimeters. And it is being heated by radiation heat transfer. Q rat is equal to 50 kilowatts. 50 kilowatts of heating for a 5 meter tube with an inner diameter of 10 millimeters. What I'm also given, which is now unusual, what is also given is the heat transfer coefficients. Well, not everywhere, but only at a few selected points. So there it is, 5, and then it is going to be given at, it is at 2.5 meters and at 1 meter that value is going to be given as 30,000 watts per square meter degree Celsius and after that when it is fully developed the heat transfer coefficient is going to be 10,000. And the question is to determine all the temperatures. The temperatures specifically determine the temperatures. That's not only the fluid temperature, but also the wall temperatures, fluid temperatures, and of course the outlet temperatures.
Remember, we are still busy on the left-hand side column. We haven't started with a constant heat flux case yet. Right. Let's start with the fluid temperatures. Fluid temperatures. The outlet temperature. Okay. Uh, let's start first, sorry, with the heat flux. The heat flux is equal to the heat transfer rate divided by the surface area. The heat transfer rate is 50 kilowatts. 50 multiplied by 10 to the 3 divided by the surface area, which is going to be pi, multiplied by the tube diameter, which is 10 millimeters, therefore 0.0. 10 meters multiplied by the tube length which is 5 meters. Okay. So the heat flux is equal to 318.3 kilowatts per square meter. You follow? So in general, we can say that the heat flux is equal to, <coughs> sorry, let me rather do it back like this. Okay. So when we go to this part of the analysis, we can see that the outlet temperature is equal to ML plus C where m is equal to that term there, there's L plus the constant. You see it? Okay. So the outlet temperature is equal to Qs P multiplied by x m dot Cp plus the inlet temperature. Okay. This is now written in terms of P. I haven't done it in terms of for a circular tube yet, but you can just substitute P with pi multiplied by the diameter. So that's easy. Okay, so the outlet temperature is equal to the heat flux, which is 318.3 multiplied by 10 to the 3 kilowatts multiplied by pi multiplied by the tube diameter multiplied by the length of the tube, divided by the mass flow rate, which is 0.7, multiplied by Cp, which is equal to 1080, plus the inner temperature, which is 20. Therefore, the outlet temperature is equal to 86.414 degrees Celsius. 86.14. So if we go to our sketch here, we can say that that temperature is 86.1 degrees Celsius. Okay. So that's the outlet temperature. In general, for any other point X, we can write it like that. T is a function of X is equal to the heat flux multiplied by P multiplied by X divided by M dot CP plus TI. Okay. QX Ach, the, the heat flux, sorry, sometimes I use QS and sometimes not, it's the same thing. The heat flux is 318.3 kilowatts, 10 to the 3, multiplied by P, which is equal to pi, multiplied by the diameter, and the diameter is equal to 0.010 divided by the mass flow rate, which is 0.7, multiplied by Cp is 
1080 plus the inner temperature, which is 20. So the general equation that we have here is equal to the temperature of the fluid is equal to 13.23 X plus 20. So that is the general temperature anywhere at the position X inside the fluid. Therefore, we can actually now go and calculate the temperature of the fluid at 1 meters. That is at that position there. Okay. We can calculate it at 2.5 meters as well as 5 meters. So at 1 meters, we can go and calculate it. It is 33.2 degrees Celsius. At 2.5, it is equal to 53.1 degrees Celsius. And we've already calculated it, but we can go and check it again for the temperature at 5 meters. It's 86.1 degrees Celsius. So I would like to show all these temperatures on this graph. So there is about 2.5 meters. That would be 5 meters, and there is 1 meter. Okay. So at 1 meter, that temperature is equal to 33.2. At that one, it's equal to 53.1. And that one we have is 86.1 degrees Celsius. You follow that? Let's look at the surface temperature. So the surface temperature is the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat flux multiplied by the surface area is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area. Temperature of the surface minus Tm, the mean temperature of the fluid. So the heat flux is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by Ts minus Tm. Or, then in general, the surface temperature is equal to the heat flux divided by the heat transfer coefficient plus Tm. So this is our general equation for the surface temperature. This mean temperature is the temperature of the fluid. And that we've already calculated everywhere. Very easy to get that. So you can see we've got that. We've got the heat flux, which is 31 uh, or 318.3 uh, kilowatts, divided by the heat transfer coefficient. So it's very simple. However, we can see that the heat transfer coefficient is not a constant. Okay. So that's why I've selected this problem. So to make provision for that, we have to go and calculate it at three different points. So the surface temperature at one meter, Ts1, is therefore equal to the heat flux, which is 318.3 kilowatts, per square meter divided by the heat transfer coefficient at one meter. At one meter, I've given the heat transfer coefficient as 30,000 watts per square meter. <coughs> oh, the heat transfer coefficient, yeah, heat transfer coefficient, 30,000 watts per square meter degree Celsius, plus Tm. And Tm at one meter, if we can just go back and look at the graph, at one meter, the fluid temperature is 33.2. So plus 33.2, which gives us the surface temperature of 43.8 degrees Celsius.
Okay, let's just go. At one meter, the fluid temperature we've already calculated is 33.2. Inner temperature is 20 and it increases linearly. So we want to know the surface temperature here. So it is the surface temperature minus the surface temperature minus the mean temperature of the fluid. You see? That delta T. And that changes as we go actually throughout the tube. And the heat transfer coefficient, as you can see, is not necessarily constant. It's only constant when the flow is fully developed. Okay? Right, so that is at one meters. Now we can go and do the same at 2.5 meters. Again, it's the heat flux. You see that part remains constant. Okay, sorry, divided by the heat transfer coefficient, and now the heat transfer coefficient is 10,000, you see? It's now 10,000, plus the fluid temperature, and the fluid temperature at 2.5 meters, 2.5 meters, if we go back to it, the fluid temperature is 53.1. Question? The mean temperature of the fluid. Yep. No, no, yeah, no. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not, well, it's going to, you see in this case, that temperature plus that temperature divided by two, I think in any case should be 53.1 because it's in the center of the tube. Okay. Okay, so the mean temperature, and it's, and it's going to be very important specifically when we go get to this part in terms of what we mean with the mean temperature. So plus 53.1, and that gives us a surface temperature of 84.9 degrees Celsius. And then the surface temperature at five meters is going to be 318 multiplied by 10 to the three divided by the heat transfer coefficient, which is 10,000, because it's in the fully developed flow regime, plus the water temperature, which is 86.1, and that gives us a surface temperature of 118 degrees Celsius. Okay. Okay. Now, I've only did the calculation for three points, for one meter, 2.5, and three meters. And you can go and do it for everywhere. Okay. However, if you now go and you generate the surface temperature graph, you're going to get the very following interesting result. And that is that from that point to that point, This delta T and this delta T is going to be the same. The delta T in the fully developed flow regime remains constant. And if you look at the equations, it tells you that. So that temperature is 118 degrees Celsius. That one is 84.9. Okay. And at one meters, that temperature is going to be 43.8. And we do not have that surface temperature yet, the inlet. Okay. So you can see the delta T is very small, very small at the inlet, where the heat transfer coefficient actually goes to infinite, very, very high. And then it decreased very, very slowly. And as it decreased, this delta T becomes constant. So this delta T, if we look at that delta T there, then it's 31.8, and there it is also 31.8. So the delta T remains constant only during the fully developed part of the tube. Very important. And here in general, where's my blue? Oh, there it is. So very importantly, for that equation, the temperature as a function of x 
is equal to 13.23 multiplied by x plus 20. Straight line. Do you follow that? Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. So this one is actually the easy one. Where we've got a constant wall temperature, except for the case when the flow is developing. But as soon as it's fully developed, then it's easier. Now we get to the right-hand side of your page. To the case of we've got a constant wall temperature. Phase change, the temperature remains constant during the phase change. It's normally a boiler, condenser, or evaporator that gives us that. So the constant surface temperature. Now the constant surface temperature is going to look like this. So that's the heat transfer coefficient as a function of x. That is x. That is equal to L. And this is our tube. And to indicate a constant surface temperature, we do it by Ts. And if you want to, you can show some bubbles here in case there's a fluid around it which is being condensed or that boils. Something like that. It's a two-phase flow regime. Now, where in this case, if we've got the constant heat flux, we are very happy. It's a bargain because we can easily determine the fluid temperature anywhere in the tube. But it's not so easy to determine the wall temperature. In the case of the constant surface temperature, the bargain is the temperature is constant. So that is our surface temperature. <coughs> now in this case, I'm going to show the surface temperature higher than that of the fluid so it's boiling the fluid. Well, there's a bo sorry, there's not, you, we don't boil the fluid, but there's a boiling process ongoing around it. And then, if that is the case, if that is the inlet temperature, then this fluid must increase in temperature. I'm going to show the dotted lines there on a linear line curve. I know it's not linear. You look at it from far away, but it's, I'm showing that is sort of the linear line. So in general, we would like to say, well, let's look at that as the bulk temperature, which is the average of the inlet and the outlet temperature. And we can maybe use this temperature difference for the heat transfer rate. Now I'm going to show to you that you're going to make a big error if that is the case. Because if we've got a constant wall temperature that heats something, we have sort of a trend, the temperature that looks like that. I should have drawn it in blue because it's the fluid. So there's the blue line, like that. And as I've said, we can get the opposite. So we can get the opposite, where that is the cooler wall, so that is Ts. And then the fluid actually does that. OK, so this is for cooling, and that is for heating. So we are tempted to say actually, well, OK, this is actually easy. We can say the, say the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area multiplied by the average delta T, the average delta T between the surface temperature and that of the fluid. 
which is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area Ts minus Tm. Remember Tm, I mean the mean temperature anywhere inside or along the tube length. So this is the average. So we can also write it as the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area multiplied by Ts minus T bulk, the bulk, bulk, which is equal to the inlet temperature plus the outlet temperature divided by 2. So in general, we can go and do a little bit of arithmetic, and I'm not going to show all the detail, but in general we can say that this average temperature can be written as delta T inlet plus a delta T outlet. We can write it as delta T inlet plus delta T outlet divided by 2. And then you can go through all the arithmetic and write it as Ts minus Ti plus Te divided by 2. And that is also equal to the bulk temperature. So it is just another way of saying that the heat transfer rate is equal to that temperature minus the bulk temperature, where the bulk temperature is the inlet and the outlet temperature divided by 2. Okay. Now, if you've got a red pen with you or any other color, what you need to do is you need to do this and say, this is incorrect. And all of you are going to be tempted in the tests and exams to do that. But how you should do, how you should do it, that we will address in the next lecture. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.